The following podcast contains explicit content and is not suitable for all listeners. By now, I think most of you listening have probably heard about the Netflix series Dirty John and the true story of John Meehan and Deborah Newell. It is one that is both believable and yet completely unbelievable at the same time. While that story is worth hearing and can be found on many podcasts, documentaries, and articles, as well as the aforementioned Netflix series, the story I found even more fascinating is that of Deborah Newell's sister, Cindy Vickers. Her story was explained in the Netflix series as an explanation for Deborah's naivete and willingness to trust and believe the lies being told to her, and also to help explain her family dynamic. But to me, I think her story highlights some of what I discussed in my previous episode and further explores women being taken advantage of due to our instinct to protect and make excuses for others' wrongdoings to us. Of course, those concepts are not gender exclusive and can happen to anyone, but for the purposes of this podcast, we will be discussing only women. Between the years of 1980 and 2008, nearly one out of five murder victims were killed by an intimate partner, and female murder victims were almost six times more likely than male murder victims to have been killed by an intimate partner. Cindy Ruth Ambrose was born on November 21, 1952, in the Orange County area of California, to parents Arlene and Wayne Ambrose. As her death has been the main topic, very little is described about her childhood. Her family was, and still are, devout Christians, and her father, who was a longtime football and track coach at various high schools, was also a youth minister at Garden Grove's Church of the Nazarene. At the age of 17, and still a high school student, Cindy met Billy Vickers, who was 18 years old and the manager at a local supermarket. They married when Cindy turned 18 and was of legal age. By all accounts, Cindy was stunningly beautiful, vivacious, headstrong, and would turn heads everywhere she went with her gorgeous blonde hair. From the outside, their marriage seemed perfect, and they had an ideal life with two young boys and a house in Garden Grove, California. Over time, Billy became increasingly jealous and possessive of Cindy, and after 13 years together, she decided to file for divorce. According to a conversation Cindy had with her mother, where she stated she no longer wanted to be married, and that she should have waited longer, as he was not the type of guy she wanted to be married to. She claimed he would not let her wear a bikini to the beach or go out by herself at night. Other reports claim that Cindy often belittled Billy or made fun of him for his baldness and looks at family gatherings. I want to take a moment to discuss some thoughts here. I myself am not extremely religious, but I can see how Billy maybe felt embarrassed and upset his wife was leaving him especially as divorce is often frowned upon in the church. I can also see how he was feeling rejected and how he probably felt as though he wasn't good enough for his wife or attractive enough. Those are valid feelings. How he handled those feelings was not okay. Also, as someone who also had a very possessive and controlling partner, I completely understand why Cindy would want to be little Billy or cause arguments. When you are constantly told to not wear certain clothing or yelled at for talking to a coworker, etc., it very much takes your power away. It's a slow process, and eventually you know what has happened, but you can't believe it got to that point. So you pick any and every instance to fight back, to nitpick, to belittle, to impart whatever little retaliation you have left in hopes of not losing all your power forever. By my research, it does not appear that Billy was ever physically abusive to Cindy, but this sort of emotional abuse is very prevalent and must be highlighted and discussed. Four in ten women have experienced at least one form of coercive control by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Billy and Cindy separated and the divorce proceeded with obvious reluctance from Billy. 
Soon after the separation, Cindy moved to Laguna Niguel and began dating a pro football player whom she met in Palm Springs. He was courting her and sending limos to pick her up. She loved the attention and soaked it all in. At this time, Billy and their older son, Shad, who was 11, moved into Cindy's mother, Arlene's home, while Shane, their youngest, stayed with Cindy. Arlene would spend time talking with Billy during this time, trying to comfort him. During the podcast, Dirty John, Arlene stated, quote, He was crying. He said, I don't, Cindy wants me to divorce. She wants to get a divorce, and I don't want a divorce. I love her so much. I can't let her go, end quote. They were in the process of selling their family home in Garden Grove, and on March 7, 1984, she opened up her own bank account. This was the final straw for Billy. According to reports, he felt that that moment was the end of their relationship and her fully out of his control. On March 8, 1984, Cindy went to their Garden Grove home to tidy up for the new buyers, and while sitting at the table writing out checks, Billy came up behind her and shot her in the back of the neck. Cindy was killed instantly. Billy then shot himself in the stomach, and at 3.08 p.m. called 911 stating, quote, I shot myself, end quote. Police reports from the incident show that she was shot at point-blank range, meaning the gun was in contact with her neck when he fired. The prosecutor in the trial stated he viewed it as a cold-blooded execution. Billy lived and was subsequently charged with first-degree murder, and the case was sent to trial. On the day of March 8th, Cindy had planned to meet her mother at noon, but after she hadn't shown, her mother went back to teaching piano lessons. At around 4 o'clock, the police arrived at her door to inform her of what had happened. Arlene was in disbelief and began praying with the officer standing right there for guidance and support. Cindy's son, Shad, who was 11 at the time, was watching TV in the other room, and Arlene was the one who had to tell him what had just happened. What is remarkable is the alleged response he gave to Arlene following the news. He said, quote, You know, Abraham Lincoln didn't have a mother. And Arlene said, Yes, that's right. You're right, Shad. And look what he turned out to be. He said, I know. I can get through this too, like you, Grandma. End quote. Billy Vickers was charged with first-degree murder because he had borrowed the gun used in the shooting two weeks prior from his friend. He had actually gone to the home of his friends, the Planchons, and told Carol, his friend's wife, that his friend said he could borrow the chrome-plated twenty-five caliber pistol with a black plastic handle to practice shoot at the range. However, as Carol and her husband would later testify to at trial, that was a lie. The friend did not give permission and was actually afraid that Billy would use it to harm himself. He testified that he had actually called Billy numerous times requesting its return, but that Billy had claimed, quote, I don't have it anymore. I got rid of it, end quote. The defense attorney was sure his client was going to receive a guilty verdict. There was no doubt that Billy had shot Cindy. He never denied it. But then, what happened next stunned everyone. I'd like to take this moment to thank you for listening to my new podcast. The concept behind femicide is very close to my heart, and I hope through these stories we can shed a light on the abuse, violence, and sexual assault that women face daily. Please subscribe to my podcast and leave a review, as it really helps bring awareness to these stories. Billy Vickers' defense attorney, James Riddett, was sitting in his office one day when he received a phone call. On the other end was Cindy's mother, Arlene. The most shocking part? She wanted to aid in Billy's defense, believing he could not have been in his right mind when he committed the murder. About six weeks following the murder, Billy, who had been hospitalized due to his injuries, wanted to speak to Cindy's family. They gathered around the phone as Billy repeatedly stated how sorry he was for what he did. Arlene told him that she still loved him. Quote, 
God has given that love to us for you. We love you and we forgive you, end quote. The defense put together testimony from Arlene, along with expert psychologists, to make a case that Billy had been in a state of temporary unconsciousness at the time and would never have done it had he been in his right mind. In trial, Arlene stated, quote, I not only like Billy, I love Billy. I knew him before, I know him now. I hated what he did. Hated, absolutely. He killed our daughter. But I still love Billy. End quote. According to the prosecution attorney, Thomas Avdif, he was stunned by the family of the victim supporting the man who murdered their daughter, and in all his years, he had never seen such a thing. He also interpreted the testimony as throwing away Cindy, throwing her under the bus, and that her family testified that Cindy mistreated Billy and spoke ill of her. Due to this testimony, the jury found Billy not guilty of first-degree murder. The jury could not come to a decision on the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter, and as such, the judge declared a mistrial. Thomas Avdith was preparing to retry the case, but Billy agreed to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter and provided a confession. He was sentenced to five years in prison. With time served and good behavior, Billy was released from prison after serving just two years, nine months, and nine days. Arlene and Cindy's sister Deborah, who again is the main character in the story of Dirty John, view it as forgiveness, which they describe in detail in their Dirty John podcast. They believe that no one is unredeemable and that everyone deserves a second chance. They choose to see the good in people and to love. While Deborah does believe this and clearly took that approach in her relationship with John Meehan, she has had a harder time forgiving Billy. She sees him time to time and while polite, would rather keep her distance. Billy Vickers has since remarried and lives in the same area of Orange County he once lived with Cindy. I could find very little on his involvement with his children following his release from prison. But from the podcast, it appears he remained a part of the family, attending family parties, functions, church events, and a son's football games. Cindy's story is a rather complicated one that dives into topics of religious beliefs, family dynamics, jealousy, and course of control. While there are many twists and turns and the outcome not what you might have expected, it is still a story of how jealousy can spiral out of control and showcases the dangerous mentality of, if I can't have you, then no one can. The ego is a fragile thing, and when damaged, the aftermath can be catastrophic. Thank you for listening to the story of Cindy Vickers. I'm your host, Sean Marie. Join me next time for a new story.